Greetings students, I'm going to recap what we did in class, which is show you how to create an inventory object and a tester for it. This should be good review to remind yourselves of a lot of the vocabulary associated with creating new objects uh, and defining classes. So uh, the purpose of our inventory object is to keep track of the number of Girl Scout cookie boxes in our warehouse. So the inventory object needs to store two pieces of information. It needs to store what's the name of the product, um, or like what's the name of the type of cookie box. So I think I'll make that a string, and I'll just call it product name. And it needs to store how many of the boxes do we have. So I will call that one um, amount. So in general, these are called fields. And fields are variables that are associated with every single inventory object you create. Because remember, when you create a class, this is like creating a blueprint which tells the computer how is an inventory object going to work, what information can it store, and what methods can it run for you. So what I'm doing is right now I'm just telling it every inventory object is going to have these two facts. All right, let's imagine how we want to use our inventory object in the tester. I think it might be nice to be able to do this. I will say inventory warehouse. So warehouse is the name of the variable that represents my inventory object. So I want to be able to create a new one. And I want to be able to tell it the name of the product that it is representing. So that's one thing I might want to do. What else would I need to do with an inventory object? I think I'd need to be able to add boxes to the warehouse and remove boxes from the warehouse. So let's pretend that we have a method called add boxes where I could tell it 30 and this should add 30 boxes to the warehouse. And it would be nice to be able to display what's the contents of the warehouse right now because otherwise how are we going to know? Um, I think it would also be nice to be able to remove boxes. And we should think about what happens if we try and remove more boxes than the warehouse actually has. So it's actually um, fairly normal practice to imagine this sort of thing, like how you're going to use your object before you actually create it. Because this is going to guide you in deciding what methods do you need to put inside the object that you're in the process of making. Let's start with this one. Uh, this is called the constructor. It, its purpose is to construct your object. Um, constructors are sort of special methods. There are two things that make them special. The first is the return type. Ordinarily, if you're writing a method that returns an int, you would say something like public int my method. If it wasn't going to return anything, you would make void here. One of the things that makes a constructor special is you don't put any value at all there, not even void. The second thing that makes a constructor special is the name of the method has to match the name of the class up here. Oops. So this is now the constructor for inventory, and this is the method that gets run whenever we want to make a new inventory object. So what does it mean to construct a new inventory object? One of the main things a constructor does is it gives values to these two instance variables up here. Instance variables, as you recall, is another name for fields. So when I'm creating a new inventory, I need to tell that inventory object what is its product and how many things does it start out with. Well, if you remember, I wanted, when I ran the inventory constructor, to be able to tell the constructor what type of product it was. So this works just like any other method. If I am, here, let's look at it side by side. So here, when I'm running the constructor, this string has to get copied into a local string variable that will be input to the constructor. So I'll say string name. And now when I run the constructor, thin mints will get stored inside of name. The problem is this variable is temporary. It only lasts as long as the constructor is running. But I want the name of the product to last as long as the entire object lasts. So I need to save this value into this field up here. So I can say product name equals name. 
and that will, so let's trace the flow of information. So Thin Mints here gets copied into name, and then name gets copied into product name. And because this is a variable that is declared as a field for my class, product name is going to last as long as my object lasts. All right, well, so far I've only set product name. If I wanted to, I could do this. I could give it an amount to start out with as a second variable, and I could say amount equals A. So now I'm constructing a new inventory for Thin Mints with 20 boxes already in it. Um, but I don't want to do that. I want to set it to be a default of zero. So that means when I create several inventory objects, in the tester here, let's create two different inventory objects. I'll call them warehouse one and warehouse two. I can create one for Thin Mints and one for Samoas. Um, each time I run the constructor, it's going to create a new copy of this object. And in the first one, Thin Mints gets copied into name, which gets stored into product name. And it gets set to, to an amount of zero cookies. Then the next time I call the constructor, it's making another copy of this object. And in this new copy of the object, it's Samoa that gets stored into name and then into product name. So now I've got two copies of this thing happening and they have different names because I told them different names when I constructed them, but they both have an amount that starts out at zero because every single thing that gets constructed is gonna get assigned zero for amount because I didn't have it as a constructor parameter. All right, um, if I want a warehouse, oh, sorry, if I want an inventory object to have an add boxes method, I've got to create the add boxes method over here because this is the blueprint that tells the computer how does an inventory object work. So I've got to think about what do I want this method to do and make sure I create it over here in a way that will do that. So add boxes, I see it needs an input that's an integer. So I'll say add boxes int amount. Let's call it uh, let's call it num instead of amount because I don't want it to conflict with this name up here, which also is amount. And let's see if it's supposed to add boxes to my warehouse. I'll say amount equals amount plus number because that's adding boxes to this variable, which is how many I have in my warehouse right now. Um, we mentioned in class that a shorthand way of writing this is like this: amount plus equals num. It just means the same thing. This means amount equals amount plus num. So I'm gonna write that because it's shorter. All right, and as you can see, um, I just resaved both of these files. Uh, it's eliminating the compile time errors one at a time. Um, before I had this, it didn't know what add boxes was, and it says the method is undefined. And then when I added it over here, I defined it, and so now it knows what to do when I try and add boxes. All right, let's do remove boxes. Um, I'm making them void return types because even though I'm removing boxes, I'm not actually trying to return information back here to the tester. Um, I'm just updating my own amount variable here um, to reflect the fact that some boxes were removed from some hypothetical physical warehouse. So I'll need number again to hold this input. And in this case, I will subtract the number of boxes from amount. And this is just amount equals amount minus num. All right, let's run the tester and see what happens. So in my print statements, you'll notice that it's printing this very uninformative string. This is actually the memory location where my object is being stored. So if we want an inventory object to be able to display itself in a print statement in a way that makes sense, we have to create a special method called toString. It returns a string. Its name is toString. Careful, it's got a capital S here and a lowercase t. And whatever string I return, that's what's going to get displayed over here when my variable appears inside a print statement. So I think I want to display... Um, there are, and then I want the amount, and then a space, and then I want the product name. So what it'll do is 
<coughs> when I uh, when I put the variable in the print statement, it will automatically run this two string method. Even though I didn't actually write dot two string, I could write it, um, but I don't have to because it it runs automatically whenever you put it inside a print statement, and it will get my object's number of boxes, and it will get my object's name, and it will put them all together as a string, and it will return that string. And now when I run it, you'll see there are 30 thin mints, and now there are negative 70 thin mints because I tried to remove 100 boxes. So this isn't working the way I want it to work. Um, so it's up to me to fix it. So here I am in remove boxes. Uh, I definitely still want to try to remove the number of boxes. How can I make this not go negative, though? One way I could do it is I could say, after I've removed them, if the amount is less than zero, then let's do this. Let's set the amount back to being zero. And now, when I run it, there's zero thin mints. It might be nice to display how many boxes we need to order, though, because if I only had 30 and I tried to remove, remove 100, it might be nice to say give a message that says, like, you need to order 30 boxes. So before I reset amount, uh, if amount is less than zero, I know it must be negative. So let's do this. System.out.println. You need to order. And then I'll say amount boxes. This is going to be a little bit weird. And you'll see why when I run it. I need to order negative 70 boxes. That's because, as I said, amount's less than zero. So this is negative. I'm just going to make it negative inside, or I'm going to put a negative sign here inside parentheses that will take the negative number inside amount and take the opposite of that number to make it be positive just for the purposes of displaying something that makes sense to everybody. So now it says there are 30 thin mints, you need to order 70 boxes, and now there are zero thin mints. So this was just a quick example of how you can construct an inventory object to do things that make sense. Let's review all the vocabulary. Um, these up here have two names we've been using. Think of what they are. They are called instance variables or fields. This is a special method. It's called the constructor. Remember, there are two important things that a constructor needs to have in this line, which is how Java knows that it's supposed to be a constructor. It shouldn't have any return type, not even void. And the name of your method should match the name of your class. The job of the constructor is to construct the object. And I said that that involves these up here. So what does it mean to construct an object? It means that you are giving initial values to these fields. Um, and you can set those initial values uh, by having the tester class give you the values or you could have default values that you set them to. Either one is okay. And then you have whatever methods you need. And usually these methods will give the tester class a way of setting these numbers here or getting these numbers here or in general sort of changing these numbers. And then last of all, if you want it to print out nicely, you have to implement toString, which returns a string that is what you want it to display. Good luck, students.